Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our for this Mazars webinar about unpacking EU climate-related guidelines and expectations. We are very happy and excited to bring this webinar to you. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. Uh, please note that we will record this webinar and we will share the recording and the slides in a PDF format afterwards. Secondly, ideally, everyone should be on mute. If you are not yet, please make sure that you mute yourself in the webinar. And finally, <clears throat> we will keep 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the presentation to answer your questions. So please, as we go through the presentation, add your questions to the chat box of the webinar and we will make sure we answer them at the end. If we don't have time to answer all questions, we will then answer them by email. Next slide, please, Corentin. So maybe to, to quickly present ourselves, uh, I am Corentin Garo and I'm happy to be here with you today. Uh, to give a few words about me, I began my career at Forvis Mazars about eight years ago, and I have worked in our quantitative solutions team in Paris. I gained expertise in financial modeling, mainly in credit risk, climate risk, but also market risk and asset liability management. I have worked with several financial institutions on numerous subjects, and currently I am working in parallel on IRB models and incorporating climate risk into a risk monitoring framework for two French banks. Thank you, Corentin. Um, and I am Pierre Alexandre Germont. I'm a director at Forbis Masters in the UK and the global climate risk lead, climate risk lead uh, with speci specific focus on data scenarios and models for climate risk. I have gained experience and knowledge uh, with uh, financial institutions, mostly banks and insurers uh, across uh, different jurisdictions, uh, working mostly uh, with uh, financial services companies in the UK, in the EU, in Africa, and in North America. Thank you very much. Um, well, welcome everyone. I'm Eric Cloutier. Uh, I'm the group head of bank regulations for Forvis Mazar. Um, so this means I'm also the head for Forvis Mazar uh, Global Regulatory Center for the fin financial sector. Um, I won't go too much in, in my background, but I've worked, uh, you know, globally on different regulatory topics and work with. Uh, supervisors and regulators across the world. Thank you, Eric. So for today's agenda, first, uh, we will give you an update on uh, the guidelines and expectations from uh, the EBAs, the ECBs, and uh, some local central banks in the EU. We will then uh, give you uh, some insights and best practices um, on how can banks meet these expectations. And at the end, uh, we will give you some key messages before answering your questions. Next slide. Trying to move the slides, but it doesn't show on the public view. Let me try and see. Okay. Yeah, just do it like this, maybe. So, okay, well, while you're doing this, I'll just uh, keep going there. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much, uh, everyone, once again, to, to join us today. Um, before, So before we go deeper into uh, how banks can meet the ECB and the broad, broader regulatory expectation on CNE risks, I would like to provide some context on the ECB's further activities and the key points under the scrutiny. Um, so since uh, 2020, EU supervisors, including the ECB and national competent authorities, so the NCAs, have been more active and prescriptive compared to the UK and US counterparts. So in the UK, while the PRE does communicate clear expectations on climate to banks, the implementation requirements are less specific in the EU, which leads to a more wait-and-see approach. Um, this said, we're seeing that the topic is gaining priority. Um, and UK banks should prepare for a wave of new regulation on the horizon. In the US, we observe a two step forward, one step back situation. This is mainly due to tensions between pro and anti ESG efforts, 
And for example, we have seen recently that the ESC, uh, SEC um, rules are introduced in March, it delays due to numerous litigation and lawsuits. So these differences in mind, cross regional banks must navigate different layers of complex expectations. However, banks on their EU standards are likely to be more prepared to comply with these other requirements. So what the ECB has done since 2020 to, 2020 to ensure that banks adequately tackle their CNA risk? Well, in short, a lot, as we all know. Um, in 2020, the ECB published its guide on CNA risks, outlining 13 supervisory expectations for banks, with full implementation required by the end of 2024. The ECB conducted extensive fact-finding exercise, including the first climate stress test in 2022. It also conducted a thematic review on climate-related risks to assess bank strategies, governance, and risk management. And as a result of this, it communicated to banks the areas needing improvements and shared good practices. The ECB also performed on-site inspection on specific sectors, such as climate risk and commercial real estate, and also assessed the accuracy of bank, banks' climate-related disclosures. On- and off-site inspections have also been ongoing to ensure compliance with the December 2024 deadlines, and we observe more and more supervisory pressures as the deadline approaches. So to discuss all this, we met recently with senior ECB leadership, uh, and, and we, we tackled the progress and their views on the pressure points remaining. So overall, the ECB response is positive. Most banks have prioritized the topics and are making necessary changes to achieve expectations on time. However, challenges and gaps still remain. The ECB continues to stress the importance of having robust climate assessments and the integration of climate risk into macroeconomic projections. The ECB also clearly stated that despite progress, some banks are still far from meeting expectations. So, for example, um, in case you've not seen last week, Frank Elderson, a member of the executive board of the ECB, mentioned in a speech that a number of banks still do not deliver on important items, such as conducting a materiality assessment of the impact of CNA risk across their portfolio. So, the ECB has indicated that from 2025, Banks with serious deficiencies can expect a much more rigid approach, including fines, but also accountability of senior leadership. Also clearly stated in Mr. Elderson's speech, bank and breach may incur a daily penalty payment. So the message is really clear here. Banks lagging behind with DCB expectation on CNA risk will cost them. So next slide, please. Next slide. Trying to do so, sorry. Yeah, perfect, thank you very much. So, okay, so now that we've set the context uh, and underscore the importance for the ECB uh, of these expectations, uh, my colleagues will discuss more in detail the actual requirements for CNE risks under Pillar 2. So as you can see from that slide, and we won't go in details on all of that, a broad range of regulatory guidelines and supervisory expectations must be complied by banks. These all complement and substantiate the different aspects of the ECB guide on the CNA risks. So for banks going forward, this means uh, they need to rapidly enhance the data collection and reporting capabilities. They need to improve risk management frameworks, and they must ensure that climate risks are fully embedded in their overall risk strategies. So a recent, a recent example uh, of changes that, that can be observed is um, the, the 2024 revised ECB guide on internal models which now includes several, several new requirements related to CNE risks. So for example, banks now need to include material CNE risk drivers in credit and market risk models and ensure these risks are fully integrated into calculations of own form requirements. Banks must also adjust the PDs and LGD models to incorporate CNE data. And also, very importantly, banks must now conduct climate-specific stress tests to evaluate the resilience of their various climate scenarios. Now, more broadly, the system-wide climate stress test, which is done in collaboration between the ECB and the EBA, can be challenging also for banks. It requires banks to gather extensive and granular data on climate risks, develop detailed climate scenarios, and adjust their internal models accordingly. So now Pierre Alexandre will develop further on that topic of climate data scenarios and model. And the floor is yours, Pierre Alexandre. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. So now we will uh, make a focus uh, on the uh, actual uh, expectations from the ECB. Uh, 
the ECB has set clear expectations when it comes to climate scenario analysis um, <coughs> dedicated to ESG risks. These uh, need to um, be incorporated into the stress testing framework of the bank using different scenarios uh, that will incorporate macro variables to uh, eventually see uh, the, the forecast and the, project, the projections of the macro, the macro variables across scenarios. In terms of time horizon, again, uh, the uh, ECB uh, expects the banks to look at different uh, terms, short term, one to three years, medium term, five to 10 years, and longer term, 20 to 30 years, which means that for each of these uh, time horizon, the ECB is uh, clearly expecting to see uh, clear differences in the macro variables, in the projections, and how these are computed. And finally, um, another key expectation from the ECB is the incorporation of the climate scenario analysis and stress testing into the risk management framework of the bank, which will have obviously uh, different impacts and implications uh, on the risk framework, because this will, uh, uh, this will affect the financial risk uh, framework. This might affect uh, the, the way the balance sheet is being looked at and modeled over time, and so on and so forth. If we look at uh, what the ECB, uh, next slide, sorry, Quentin. If we look at what the ECB uh, performed in 2022 with the climate uh, stress testing exercise, um, there were some key takeaways uh, from the ECB. Uh, <clears throat> in its thematic review for climate data, climate scenarios, and climate models. Um, a lot of it related basically to uh, the observations made uh, on how the banks performed. Uh, first of all, uh, the ECB uh, pointed at the quality of the data, which was uh, sometimes uh, outdated um, and to a high level, not granular enough. Um, the, the ECB also, um, complained about uh, the, um, the the use um, of proxy models instead of counterparty level data. On the scenario side, uh, the ECB reinforced uh, its message that uh, there should be a clear distinction between short term, medium term, and long term scenarios. Uh, some of the banks having performed only medium to long term scenarios and not short term enough, and vice versa. The ECB also um, reminded the importance of the incorporation into the existing financial uh, risk framework, mainly credit risk, uh, operation risk, and market risk, with also uh, the uh, incorporation into ICAP element, keeping in mind that um, these scenarios need to be uh, more quantitative and not only qualitative. So these needs to be supported and incorporating uh, quantitative elements. Finally, on the model side, um, the best approaches and practices uh, evidenced by the ECB was bottom-up approach, which means uh, shocking um, counterparties at the asset level and then aggregating up instead of having shocks at the economy level and then cascading down. Another best practice that was uh, highlighted uh, by the ECB was to leverage uh, the bank's existing trade risk models, PD and LGD models, uh, to, to leverage these models and then adjust them for climate risk, which eventually uh, uh, allows for more transparency and comparability. Um, <clears throat> now we will uh, look at the EBS expectations and Corentin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pierre Alexandre. So to follow on regulatory expectations, the EBA published in January 2024 draft guidelines on management of ESG risk. It has done so as mandated by the CRD6, aiming to provide guidance on how to apply the new banking package, as well as complementing the previous SAB expectations. It is still in a draft format, but nevertheless reflects key principles which normally will appear in the final version. Among those, we may highlight, for instance, that impacts of ESG risk should be considered at short-term, medium-term, and long-term horizon, as was stated by the ECB, 
It is a key challenge for banks as some risk processes such as ICAP don't natively go to long-term horizons. We may also highlight that the proportionality principle applies. It is not clearly defined, but the spirit is that banks can adapt the complexity of their ESG approaches to the complexity of their activities, but also of their risk processes. Those guidelines cover the full chain of risk processes. The first step is the, the identification of ESG risk. For instance, by adding ESG into a bank's risk materiality assessments. It is often the first uh, step that regulators follow and check. This allows, allows also to identify which ESG risk is a priori most impactful for a bank and which data will be needed to assess this risk. Then, filling data gaps and developing metrics would allow to measure ESG risk thanks to metrics. In particular, and it is new in those guidelines, the EBA describes three types of metrics. First one is exposition-based metrics, which aim at following the current risk on a portfolio. For instance, it might be the, an EPC rating distribution to follow transition risk on a mortgage portfolio. There are also portfolio-based metrics to follow the adequacy of the portfolio to net zero emission objectives. And finally, scenarios-based metrics, which aim at measuring the ESG impact on future scenarios. Then, the EBA describes also that methodologies should be developed to include ESG risk into all risk processes of the banks. Mitigation tools should also be put in place, such as using limits or alerts on ESG indicators. And finally, financial institutions should develop also transition plans with objectives at sectors and portfolio levels according to CRD6 expectations. Thank you very much for this. Um, so now we've, we've discussed until now the ECB expectations and how significant its institutions are coping. Um, just uh, um, as a, a little bit of a, of a bracket here, um, I will focus on the less in significant institutions, OLSIs, and how the supervisors, the NCAs, are considering senior risk for the smaller banks. Um, so we can we observe, uh, as you can see from that slide, that many NCAs across the EU the EU are following the example of the ECB for the supervisory approach, also using the core principle of the ECB guide as a, as a baseline. So for example, since 2022, many NCAs have sent questionnaires to banks, issued DSCO letters, uh, collected thematic reviews, and overall integrated the CNE risk into the local shred. So proportionality is therefore somewhat of a concern for LSIs. A DCB guide, with, guide was developed for larger banks, and maybe cumbersome for smaller institutions. If we take the example of France, um, the uh, SAPA approach, so the local uh, supervisor, has been following the footstep of the ECB for the supervision of LSIs on CNE risk. So following a questionnaire they sent to, to banks in 2023, the SAPA provided banks with broad recommendations in early 2024 and required banks to comply by the end of 2024. So a very short time frame for implementation. This required banks to, to put in place specific teams um, and, um, and gather, gather data on, on, on climate as well. Um, the challenge they face is that smaller banks often have limited resources and capabilities to do this. So developing climate assessment methodology is also a challenge for them, um, as no clear uh, methodology consensus have yet emerged in the industry. So as uh, Corentin mentioned, the final EBA guidelines on ESG G risk coming at the end of the year, um, you know, some clarity might be provided there. Uh, but this said, um, you know, there's still the, the, the proportionality uh, principle in these guidelines might still lead to discrepancies as it remains quite vague uh, and broad. Uh, therefore, we might still see some discrepancies as well between jurisdictions. So LSIs need to be mindful of this uh, and follow that very carefully. Pierre Alexandre, floor is yours. Thank you, Eric. So in, in this first section, uh, we went through uh, some key uh, updates, some key expectations and guidelines uh, from the regulators. So now we will see in the second section how uh, some best practices on how banks uh, can meet these expectations. <laughs> 
On this slide, uh, we give you a, a best practice step-by-step -step approach to perform a bottom-up climate scenario analysis. Uh, as you recall, bottom-up uh, is one of the key expectations uh, from the ECB. The first step is really to define uh, the objectives of the scenario analysis exercise. What is your existing setup? What is the regulatory walkthrough? And so the, the next step that you will need to accomplish to get there. It's also important to define the scope um, on your uh, portfolios, on your uh, existing risk and upcoming risks that have not yet been identified. Once this is done, and this mostly basically starts with the material assessment. When this is done, you can move on to what we call the data management framework. And this is a very important step because this will uh, set uh, the uh, anchor point for the whole exercise uh, going forward. And the data management framework is essentially um, doing uh, a gap analysis, uh, portfolio by portfolio, uh, geographies by geographies, uh, climate risk by climate risk of the data you currently have available and the current the data you actually need to perform your scenario analysis. When this is done, you move on to the selection and the design of the actual scenarios. Here, uh, you can either follow some commonly used scenarios by the governing bodies or design your own scenario, which will be more specific to your business model. The next step will be uh, to perform the actual assessment, the actual quantification of the scenario analysis. And here, this is where the models come into play and you will need to select or design models that are bespoke once again to your asset classes and to the types of climate risks that you're looking at. Once this is done and you have actual quantified numbers, you will need to report them in a meaningful way, which means you will need to document all of them and you will need to um, communicate them internally, especially to uh, the uh, groups of work and the board that have oversight for climate risk. And finally, the final step is to integrate and incorporate uh, these uh, outputs into your existing frameworks. That could be the risk framework with the financial risk, but that could be also other business streams that can be impacted or enhanced with the scenario analysis exercise. Over to you, Quentin. So thank you, Per Alexon. Now we'll uh, describe each of these steps in the uh, framework to uh, assess climate risk. The first one is to define the scope that we want to model. So climate risk comes in two aspects that we try to model, physical risk and transition risk. Physical risk includes extreme and chronic weather events. For instance, extreme events can be flooding and chronic events can be a rise in temperature and drought. Transition risk on the other side includes risk stemming from economic adjustments necessary for decarbonization of the economy. So when assessing impact of this risk on a bank, the first step is to try to identify main transmission channels that impact all the common risk of the bank. So credit risk, market risk, liquidity risk, and so on. Those transmission channels change depending on the specific activities of each bank. But in general, what we can say is that on the credit risk side, main transmission channels that, that we can see are, for instance, an impact of physical risk on the value of assets, which are collateral, thus increases the bank credit losses when a default occurs. Also, a higher carbon cost could impact the solvency of a corporate, thus increasing the bank's credit loss due to higher default probabilities on the corporate portfolios. We can also uh, mention on the liquidity side that one transmission channel can be an increase in withdrawal of site accounts due to client, client financing their reparation cost after a climate event. Then once we have identified the transmission channels that we want to model, we need the core material to feed them the data. And as for the data, a data management framework, as said Pierre Alexandre, must be constructed to be able to first identify what we require as data based, for instance, on the geographical areas and asset classes of the concerned portfolio. And as such, making a cartography of the portfolio is key here to detect which transmission channel will be modeled and how. Then, to develop models 
or make partnerships to bridge the identified data gaps and obtain key variables to assess climate risk. For instance, for physical risk, it can be hazard data for flooding or forest fires. And for transition risk, it can be GAG emissions for corporates or EPC ratings for retail portfolios. In any case, those data should also be derived on chosen scenario, reflecting the type of climate stress we want to model. And the rationale behind these scenarios design will now be presented by Pierre Alexandre. Thank you, Corentin. Um, the, the scenario step is actually a, a very important one, um, and it's not always uh, very clear on what scenarios should be used, especially when we perform an exercise outside a typical uh, regulatory stress setting exercise. To, keeping in mind that uh, there are a lot of different scenarios currently uh, available or followed uh, internationally. So we have uh, some commonly used scenarios from the NGFS, mostly on transition risk, the IPCC on the physical risk. We also have uh, those from the regulators um, that mostly leverage or benchmark uh, the NGFS or IPCC ratings and will be more tailored to um, a specific region or sp some specific asset classes depending on the jurisdictions. That said, not all of these scenarios can be relevant, applicable, or I would say comprehensive enough for uh, the purpose of an ongoing stress testing exercise. And for that reason, uh, we see uh, some uh, banks actually designing their own scenarios which can leverage some of the um, uh, regulatory or international governing body scenarios, but also incorporate other elements like <clears throat> some different time horizons, some different macro variables. We also see uh, more and more um, research and uh, actual uh, practices of incorporating, for instance, tipping points, uh, which is a, a big discussion topic uh, at the present time. We also see uh, the emergence of uh, stochastic scenarios uh, which differ uh, from the de deterministic scenarios of uh, the regulators or the international governing bodies. So it's very important that uh, the bank takes the time uh, to understand what scenario or what scenarios are the most relevant and applicable to its business model. We'll now, we'll now move on to the assessment step and it's over to you, Quentin. Thank you. <clears throat> so we'll start with uh, the transition risk assessment for corporate. So in Europe, significant banks have begun working on climate risk model from at least 2022 for the EBA first climate stress test. Usually, first models that have been developed were focused on transition risk, mainly because they could leverage on existing credit risk models and also that more data were available. The main idea globally is to incorporate carbon price scenarios into the modeling of the default probability of a corporate. And let's note that in the credit landscape, the Merton framework is often used to model this default probability, where the default occurs when assets become lower than debts. In essence, most transition risk models rely on decreasing the value of assets due to carbon price, thus increasing the probability of default. In practice, one of, the, one of the best practices that we have observed and used is the following. We start from initial default probabilities, which could come, for instance, from existing credit risk model, from uh, IFRS 9 uh, models, for instance. Using this probability of default, we imply in the Merton model an asset to debt ratio. In other words, we find a theoretical asset debt ratio which would lead to, th to these initial probability of defaults. Then, we shock this implied asset debt ratio by incorporating carbon cost relative to greenhouse gas emission and profitability of the corporate. And finally, we use a shocked asset debt ratio in the Merton framework to obtain stressed default probabilities. So the, the main advantages of this approach are the following, is that first of all, it does not require a lot of inputs, only a couple of balance sheet items, and also GHG and revenue data about the corporates. It also has a great advantage to leverage on credit risk models. Uh, this approach does not replace current credit models, but rather enhances them to apply a climate overlay. Uh, 
And as such, it is an easy way to add climate shock without amending the bank existing PD models. Also, uh, the impacts that we obtain can easily be explained because of the relative simplicity of the approach. On the other hand, there are uh, challenges to this approach, uh, namely to, uh, or for example, to calibrate the Merton model parameters and the shock applied to the asset debt ratio of the corporate. Thank you, on the, uh, physical risk. Thank you, Corentin. Um, so I'm now going to uh, talk through a, a bit uh, of a best practice approach for uh, physical risk for corporates. Again, uh, the key message as for uh, the transition risk approach is uh, with this best practice, the bank actually uses its own uh, baseline PD uh, as an input to the climate model. And so, as Corentin was saying, uh, the advantage is that it doesn't replace the existing PD model, it doesn't tweak it neither, but rather use it as an input. When it comes to physical risk for corporates, uh, the approach is different from that on transition risk. Uh, the, the first step really, and this goes back to the importance of the data management framework at the start, it's to locate all the physical assets um, that are relevant to the corporate portfolio that could be either uh, at the uh, mother company level but also at the subsidiaries if relevant right so it's important to have the right tools to the right maps to identify all of these physical assets and for each of these physical assets it's important to establish a list of uh, the appropriate hazards um, affecting the assets once this is done the second step will be to uh, create what we call what we call sorry damage functions damage curves for each of these hazards and see how to what level to what extent they actually impact each of the geolocation uh, locations that we have in the portfolio at this stage we have uh, a, i would say a raw uh, damage metric that we will then see how it can be mitigated either by insurance or by other mitigating factors like state support. So at this stage, we have what we call a mitigated, uh, an adjusted damage, which we will then translate into an impact uh, on uh, the corporate's uh, balance sheet and PNL. So see, for instance, how the capex will be uh, uh, affected uh, with reinvestment uh, in assets or repairs in assets and see how it will also uh, disrupt business revenues or increase business costs. And so at the end, we come up with a meaningful financial impact that we can then translate and incorporate into the PD and the LGD of uh, the bank. Another key aspect uh, in the physical risk approach, uh, which goes beyond uh, the corporate itself, is uh, the impact on the supply chain. And uh, that, that quite differs from the transition risk approach from that perspective as well, because uh, it is important to understand how physical risk will actually impact uh, the suppliers, but also the ex uh, export countries relevant to the specific industry. We will now move on to um, the approach for real estate, and it's over to you, Cord. Thank you, Pierre Alexandre. Uh, so, so we gave insights on modeling impacts of transition risk and physical risk for corporates. For uh, mortgage portfolio, the approach is quite similar, but has some specificities. We'll go through physical risk and transition risk. For, for physical risk, banks uh, are much more advanced than on corporate for portfolio because the transmission channel is much more straightforward. You can say that an impact on the collateral real estate has a direct impact on the borrower. We don't have this multi-address and value chain dimensions that we have on the corporate side. Also, the, but nevertheless, the idea is the same as for corporate. It is to leverage on current credit risk models rather than developing new frameworks. For instance, the, the solvency of the borrower and thus its probability of default could be hindered by the potential financing of the reparation. Also, on the transition risk, on the um, loss given default side, the value of the asset could decrease due to a climate event, thus impacting the loss given default. In practice, 
what we observe on market is that main modeling differences are access to pertinent and granular data source as well as the number of physical risks that are covered. Do we cover flood? Uh, do we cover forest fires? And so on. For transition risk, the approach is quite different than for corporates because here we do not rely on carbon prices but rather on the impact of the EPC rating. More precisely, we model how the EPC rating or a downgrade of this EPC rating will impact the credit parameters. On the probability of default side, let's uh, mention that new regulations can impact the capacity of the borrower to rent assets with a bad EPC rating. That is what is happening currently in France, for instance, where there is a calendar of, uh, um, of uh, EPC ratings, uh, thresholds above which a borrower cannot rent his under underlying assets, which would hinder his, uh, diminish his revenues and impact his solvency. Also, a bad EPC rating can impact the value of the asset and as such increasing the loss giving, uh, given default. So these modeling approaches are applied on portfolios at different horizons and Pierre-Alexandre will now present how portfolios can be projected in a dynamic modeling approach. Thank you, Corentin. Um, as we said before, uh, one of the uh, key, I would say, best practice uh, guidelines from the ECB Although it was not uh, a mandatory requirement of, as part of the CST in, two, in 2022, because banks had the, the choice uh, to work on a static or dynamic basis, it is still a best practice uh, to try and uh, model dynamic balance sheet uh, as part of the climate scenario exercise. Some of the key um, uh, highlights of, of uh, this approach really is to construct this dynamic balance sheet again uh, over different time horizons. Uh, I would say mostly up to 20, 30 years. Um, and for that, uh, the banks use uh, different uh, factors, uh, and this leverage and they leverage basically the, the assessment that has been uh, made uh, before, like we, we saw for corporates and. Uh, and uh, mortgages. So they will use, uh, first of all, uh, the adjusted collateral values um, <clears throat> based uh, on the real estate assessment. They will also look at uh, how uh, GHG emission are projected and forecasted portfolio por by portfolio, sector by sector, and they will try um, to uh, relate that with their strategy, with their climate strategy. So a lot of banks, uh, have already uh, established uh, their appetite for, uh, I would say, brown and green sectors. And so uh, they will be able uh, over time to adjust their sector allocation based on that. Another key element to take into account uh, when uh, modeling dynamic balance sheet is uh, the GDP projections by geographies, because obviously the bank will have uh, revenue target or certain appetite depending on the jurisdictions and so they need to take into account uh, the expected uh, project GDP projections uh, by country. Taking all this into account one key element as I was uh, briefly mentioning is uh, to tying it back to the bank strategy and so there is a, a joint approach between uh, modeling, uh, assessment, and the strategy to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Now that uh, we've uh, performed uh, the quantitative assessment, the next key step is, uh, like I was saying, to make sense uh, of all uh, the, this assessment, which can be very cumbersome uh, for banks because these are large portfolios with a lot of lines of assets across 20, 30, 50 years. So it, uh, working, for instance, with uh, just uh, uh, huge data sets can be very difficult uh, to manipulate. So some of the best practices uh, we see from banks is actually the use of uh, web tools, web applications, where they can actually um, manipulate and visualize uh, 
the most important data, the most important steps of their uh, analysis. If we start with the identification, which is part of the data management framework, some of the banks are using uh, what we call uh, hazard maps, uh, which are very useful, first of all, for, like we were saying, when it comes to real estate or, or, to, or to corporates, to have the geo-coordinates of the assets and to quickly visualize how vulnerable these assets are to the different hazards. So here, for instance, uh, I took the example of a, a flood map uh, in France, in Paris, and quickly we can, the, the, uh, as part of the identification, we can see clearly which assets and which areas are the most vulnerable to flooding. Another example uh, in, in the middle of the, the slide is um, <clears throat> the uh, selection of relevant KPIs. Uh, and here we take the example uh, of corporate transition risk. So we, like we were saying, CO2 emission is a key variable. And so um, we want to quickly uh, identify the assets, the sectors or the countries um, that are uh, the most vulnerable to carbon price increases. And finally, uh, the quantification and the incorporation into financial risks. Again, having uh, a, a dashboard uh, displaying uh, the projections of uh, climate adjusted PDs, LGDs, and ECL over time and across scenarios can be very useful to report and communicate internally. Quentin. Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm just going back to the slides. So uh, today we have presented main steps for defining a quantitative framework to identify, measure, and monitor climate risk. Ultimately, the use of such frameworks is to provide inputs to different risk monitoring processes of the bank and to incorporate climate risk in the strategy. In a risk and capital framework, we can highlight the addition of metrics in the risk appetite framework to give insights to the managing bodies who can then take actions to address potential threshold breaches and alerts. Also the incorporation of climate risk in the ICAP and ILAP internal capital assessments. For ICAP, by adding a climate color to existing normative scenarios, even creating a specific climate scenarios if, uh, if need be, and also by calculating a specific climate economic capital. There is also the enhancement of collateral valuation, considering ESG risk, to address prudential requirements. Finally, the regulatory entities have also started mentioning the addition of ESG risk into IFRS 9 provisions and also internal rating scales, which will be uh, the, the next steps. Then, on the transformation point of view, there is the update of risk and uh, the, the update of risk and capital framework will also lead to changes in the lending strategy. For instance, by including physical risk and transition risk into the loan origination process and pricing. And finally, this quantitative climate framework is also a key enabler in providing sound and meaningful disclosures for new ESG requirements, such as finance GHG emissions, physical hazard exposures, and green asset ratios. So in brief, Climate risk quantification plays a key part in the climate transformation of the risk processes, as such highlighting the importance of developing modular and robust frameworks dedicated to climate risk assessment. Thank you very much, Corentin and Pierre Alexandre. Um, just maybe before I provide the conclusion on, on our discussion, just want to remind that uh, we will have a, a short Q&A session after. If you uh, could put your question in the uh, in the adequate uh, you know uh, chat section uh, in the web uh, in the webinar, please do so. Otherwise, you can always reach out to us after the the, the webinar. So to conclude, um, I, suggest, I suggest that we recap the key messages for banks uh, on their climate risk journey. Um, so I'll, I'll mention a few of the of the key takeaways here. But first of all, define your sustainability sustainability strategy. So determine your target, target position, whether it's minimum compliance, listening and following or leading the way. This decision will shape your entire approach. Prioritize key climate risk. So conduct a materiality assessment to focus on the most critical areas for your business. This ensures that your resources and efforts are directed where they matter, they matter the most. 
also start now. It's never too late to begin. So this is a journey, of course, and new plans will adapt, uh, adapt over time. So the integration of climate risk into financial analysis is still developing. So your approach will, uh, it will evolve uh, uh, as well uh, as time goes by. Enable success is also very important. This can be achieved uh, through ensuring clear commitment from the top, investing in training to upskill your teams, improving your data man management, and establishing robust reporting systems, but also performing regular stress testing on your strategies. So in short, progress over perfection. So don't let the pursuit of perfection hinder your progress and have a plan to address any weaknesses in your strategy. Of course, um, your supervisor will expect you to meet full expectations and very quickly. However, in our view, it's better to show progress in line with a clear plan than to be perceived as resisting changes. So thank you all for your attention and joining us. We'll now move to the Q&A session. Pierre Alexandre. Thank you, Eric. Okay, so we have a couple of questions. Uh, the first question is, you mentioned that the ECB is now moving to a more rigid penalty approach for non-compliant banks. What does it mean exactly? I think, Eric, that's the question for you. Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, good point. I mean, as we've seen uh, in the last probably six months uh, on different speeches and blogs of the ECB, uh, they're really moving not just for climate risk, but for uh, most uh, important topics where banks have been lagging behind. They, stated clear, they clearly stated that they are now moving their escalation ladder. Um, so before, the ECB has been focused mostly on you know, P2R impact, so capital add-on. Uh, but now they, they realize that um, for some big topics, which require a lot of investments, uh, such as you know, some areas of, of adapting to climate risk, um, banks perceive the you know, capital add-on as a cost of doing business. So now they clearly stated that they will use all the tools available in the toolbox uh, to pressure banks to act more quickly uh, on topics that they, you know, they, they assume should or they expect that banks should be fully compliant by now. Um, so that means, you know, as I said before, uh, potentially daily fines and potentially other impacts also for senior management of the bank. So, uh, so they're really turning up uh, the heat on, on banks. Thank you, Eric. Um... Another question, uh, more on the technical side, uh, about if uh, the, sh the slides will be shared afterwards. Uh, the answer is yes, so we will share the slide in a PDF format and we will also share uh, the recording of the webinar. The next question um, is more on the climate risk assessment itself. Which challenges uh, are banks mostly facing while performing the assessment? So I think I can take this one. Um, I think there are different um, areas where we see banks uh, facing some challenges. Uh, first of all, that's uh, about internal resources. And this comes down to sometimes the size of the bank or uh, the priority and the importance of climate risk uh, in corporation. Uh, so resources, it can be either human resources, so having dedicating teams, departments or sub-departments working on the climate risk assessment. It could be also uh, resources in terms of data, in terms of uh, models and so on and so forth. So um, uh, for the data, for instance, uh, some banks are struggling uh, to have access to uh, granular, up-to-date and relevant data, either on the hazard side or uh, on the, the counterparty side. Uh, counterparty side could be, for instance, um, uh, the actual CO2 emissions or estimated CO2 emissions of the corporates. It could be uh, the EPC ratings uh, of the properties. So these can be some challenges. Another challenge that we see on the model side um, is obviously to have uh, dedicated, bespoke and relevant models like we saw today uh, per asset class and per physical slash transition risk. I would say um, most progress that has been made so far uh, in general across the EU in terms of modeling is on the transition risk for corporates physical risk for real estate and then to a lesser extent uh, 
we see banks um, incorporating a transition risk for uh, real estate and physical risk for corporates. But I would say that especially physical risk for corporates is still an, an early stage and a lot of banks are still trying to figure out um, how to perform and uh, incorporate it. Is there any questions? Uh, there is uh, another uh, question. Um, in case of non-availability of data, banks are using proxy models. What do you think about these proxy models? And also, do you think there could be penalties in long run for using proxy data? Um, proxy data sets. Um, I think, and, and, and I think uh, I, I don't want to uh, answer for the ECB, but if we look at what the ECB, um, uh, the, the clear message from the ECB after the, the stress test in 2022 was that banks were over relying on proxy models. So there's two ways to look at it really and to understand the message from the ECB. The, I think the ECB acknowledges the fact that um, data is a clear challenge, if not uh, the biggest challenge when it comes to climate risk. For obvious reasons, it's a new category of risk. Uh, banks and the, the banking system in general didn't have to really look at it for a long time, and now it, it comes uh, quite suddenly. So I think the ECB acknowledges the fact that uh, data uh, is, a key, is a key challenge, and that for that reason, banks may have to use proxy models. That said, I think what the ECB uh, is concerned about is the uh, over-reliance on these proxy models when I think the ECB thinks that a lot of the data could actually be um, collected or acquired, and there are different ways of doing that. Uh, that could be uh, either by enhancing um, the uh, engagement with the customers uh, at the origination, for instance, uh, of, of the relationship, or through uh, third-party providers. And there's a that comes to a, it shifts, I, I would say, to another conversation and, and problematic, which is how can we rely on third-party data? Mm -hmm. And I think what the ECB is saying is that um, there should be, a, a, as part of uh, the journey and this is probably part of the data management framework, uh, maybe a, a more thorough exercise and due diligence on um, highlighting the gaps in the data. So making it clear uh, what data is available, what data is not yet available, but most importantly, how this gap will be bridged. And if possible, first of all, through actual data rather than proxy models. That said, um, it is today probably impossible to rely on pure actual data uh, for climate risk. So the, as long as the, the bank is capable to prove that it has done um, its best to acquire or use or collect actual data, I think the use of proxy model is still accepted. Yeah, and, and if I can add on this what Alexandre, uh, because um, you mentioned a lot of the ECB, of course, um, the EBA uh, 2024 guide on ESG risk as well underscores some of those principles. Uh, so, which echo uh, really well what you just said. Um, they do acknowledge as well uh, that you know not all data is available, uh, but if proxies are used, uh, but they must, they must demonstrate that they're reliable and, and well justified. Um, you know, that to to ensure that it's accurate and credible. Uh, also, you know, transparency of the methodology around the proxies. Uh, and, and they state also very clearly that uh, banks must evolve from using a proxy, the proxies as the data become more available in the future, right? But also the EBA acknowledged that, you know, there's still some issues with data. Thank you, Eric. Um, is there any final question, final comment? If not, um, as we said, uh, we will share uh, the slides uh, in a PDF format and the link to the recording of the webinar uh, afterwards. And we thank you uh, for your participation today to this webinar. We hope uh, it was uh, useful and that you enjoyed the content.
and we wish you a very good day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.